I didn't see you there. Something big is going on here. From hunting ghosts to Bigfoot. Paranormal, UFOs, true crime, and more. We won't just be spouting articles. I was researching for your entertainment. The beginning of a new world. The best guac you'll ever fucking eat. True story. It's basically like one day you walk outside and you see that the ants are playing with matches. This, this is, is the Black Cat Report. Report. See you on the other side. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 28 of the Black Cat Report, the Mojave Incident Part 3. My name is Gil, and I am absolutely delighted to announce we got the full crew on this episode tonight. That means we got a Betsabe. Hello. That means we got a Selena. Happy New Year. (laughs) And somehow, by the grace of all that's unholy, we got a Joey. Yay, I'm back. Woo! I'm back, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> now, I got way too much flack for how I ended uh, episode two of this series and was forced by both fans and the crew here to do a part three. And so let's dive in. Where we last left off, Tom and Elise Gifford had been tortured for over eight hours by a variety of extraterrestrials. The intensity kept building up until finally it climaxed with the appearance of an angelic-like being which assured them they would be okay and it would all be over soon. Tom and Elise mysteriously fell asleep, woke up early, and got the hell out of there. They only stopped once to see if an older couple that was camping nearby just a few miles away had saw anything the night before. Spoiler, they hadn't. They had gone to bed early and hadn't seen a thing. Okay. Now let's get back to the story. Before making it back to the highway, they had one more moment of panic. Up in the morning sky, they noticed a triangle formation of light shining. Tom hit the gas and sped off to the highway. Mm -mm. When they got home, they tried to act normal, play it off like everything was okay while Elise was nearly in tears when Tom Jr. ran up and hugged her. Tom's mom immediately pointed out that Elise looked like she'd been sick. All but blowing off the comment, she said she's just tired as she started walking into the house. Struggling struggling to humor small talk, Elise barely got her shoes off before passing out in bed. Wolfie and Carol, picking up on the cues, quickly wrapped things up and headed home. Tom settled into the playroom with Tom Jr., who was flipping through the channels. A hallucination... A bad dream, a bystander, a a pawn in a dark strategy. Did it even happen? What does it mean? How the hell will they ever be the same? How could he be the same after what they just went through? The reality or unreality of last night's experience was kicking around through his mind, perfectly juxtaposed against the laughter and smiles of his son. The room's perfect contrast settled into Tom beginning to feel all the anxieties of regular life come back to him before quickly becoming weightless. How could he possibly care about work on Monday after this? The seeds of trauma were sprouting in silence. This moment was only broken when Tom Jr. flipped past an episode of The Twilight Zone. Tom yelled out, STOP! He knew this one. It was about aliens landing on Earth and humans misunderstanding what they meant when they said to serve man. Tom Jr. watched his dad, taken back by the comment, taken in by the look being pulled off his face. He was consumed. The timing couldn't have been more poetic. Tom broke into an empty, hysterical laughter while his son finally asked, Dad? Cutting through the moment, he broke down into tears. That first night would set the tone which would stick with them for the next couple of years. Waking up screaming around three in the morning, Elise would get out of bed and shuffle to the kitchen, where she found Tom already wide awake. They quickly realized that nightmares had brought them both there. Elise asked if he remembered what happened the night of the encounter, to which he quickly replied, quote, All of it. Why? End quote. She then pointed out that when they fell asleep, the beings were still there, end quote. So how do we know other things didn't happen while we were sleeping, end quote. 
He acknowledged the possibility, but brought up the fact that they were still in the camper, on the ground, the entire time the experience was going on. Her reply, quote, My point is, I don't think we ever came down from the museum. Tom, her chin quivered, we were on board the craft the whole time, and that's what my nightmares are about, not the experience. The time after the experience, when we were sleeping. She was a few steps ahead of Tom in connecting the dots he'd been struggling with. While he did have a very clear, vivid memory of the experience, he also had vague, dreamlike recollections of a bright, passage-like tunnel. The second he mentioned these blurred memories, she told him they were the same images she had been dreaming of. This conversation marked a turning point. Tom was overwhelmed by the idea that somehow even more may have happened than what he could remember. Struggling to process what he already knew, he wanted to bury the memories. Elise, on the other hand, wanted to dig into them, look for clues that might help them understand, process, or even explain that night's events. With no way of knowing why she was forced to live through those terrible visions, Elise was still carrying the fear that the beings might someday come down and take her kids. Again, they literally showed the imagery of it to her. She lived through those experiences. She was stuck asking herself, were they threats? A way of communicating intent or just senseless torture for their own enjoyment? These questions, along with the two sore puncture marks she found on her neck, left her thinking that this experience wasn't over. Oh my gosh. Yep. <clears throat> About 12 hours later, while Elise was lying on her back, enjoying alone time with Zoe, who was snuggling up on top of her, they were sitting in the playroom. Doors closed, windows closed, everything shut when she began to notice that the curtains started to move. Nope. Like being pushed by a wind with no source behind them. Mm. <laughs> Within days, it became evident that Elise and Tom were developing different paths in handling the trauma they now dealt with. Elise took to finding and consuming any and all all information she could about UFOs, aliens, and abductions, spending every day, all day, in the same room, reading and researching, trying to make connections to what others had experienced and the senseless torture her and Tom had been through. I just cannot believe they just went home and, like, kept going on with their lives. <laughs> it's it's an honest like thing though like we we cover abductions we listen to podcasts and like watch documentaries and stuff where people talk about their experiences but like how much if any time at, at least on my end like how much of any time is really given to like w what about the in-between time yeah. what about the time between like the experience and when you go to a hypnotherapy session or when you connect with an author or when you start talking about it if you even do Right. Most people, I would assume, don't even fucking talk about this stuff or they don't have the connections or, or the, the ability to go out there and find the people to talk about it. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Like you can't. And just, like, to, I was just going to say, you can't just go to like a therapist and say I was abducted by aliens. Like that could be seen yeah. as like a schizophrenic disorder or like a paranoid delusion or like all kinds of things. Drugs. Yeah. We're we're like literally we're living in a new golden era of like um of just general social acceptance in America around UFOs, aliens, like the 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 idea that this is happening, that this is real is not something that puts you in the loony bin anymore. Like automatically. It's it's still something. It's still a trauma. It's still isolating. It's still really heavy. But like holy hell they're dealing with this in 1989 nowhere near <laughs> like where we're at right now yeah, that's, that's uh I mean. at this point in recording this episode 34 years ago yeah and like i'm, I'm just kind of piggybacking like this this gets no spotlight this gets no attention we might hear in passing this ruin their lives anyways mm -hmm. about the probe and then we just skip to that but we don't actually hear about like what what what, what is mean? it like yeah yeah. yeah, it's like somebody has one night. They have one night of this 
insane intense experience however they they decide to view it later whether it was good and lightning or or torture and then they have to go back to work the next day and deal with kids (laughs) with your family not even deal with kids she was happy to see her children she was like Mm. i I have them they're not gonna take them from me yeah yeah well but just to be mentally and physically there for them after that experience like that must be so hard because you're still dealing with the trauma and everything mm-hmm. that you just went through and then be like, oh, hey, kids, you know? Well, I'm going to say, mm-hmm. I think that these aliens were onto something. They were bringing back stuff from, they were bringing back stuff from the future. Those those blinds moving were actually motorized blinds and she just didn't know that they installed <laughs> them for her. And they were just like, here you go. And she just got super, super paranoid. And then when they were in the van, they put on 3D Oculus glasses for them. And they were just the in these crazy worlds, you know, like Matrix worlds. So I don't know what Joey, these aliens is, were doing. But I'm, Joey, I missed the last terrible... two episodes. So I'm no, just catching didn't. up. Okay, guys. Joey, okay, okay, audience, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent. So please skip 30 seconds if you don't want to hear this. Um, Audience, like... Joey, that was the worst way to promote somebody who I know is your current client <laughs> right now. And that was totally, you You didn't read the room, my man. <laughs> Anyways, um, I love you, brother. Um, and yes, you listened to the past episodes more than we have because you fucking produced them. Um, so, That's anyways. so Joey. Damn, rip, rip him to shreds. Jeez. <laughs> love the boy. <laughs> Jeez, I was just trying to, you know, Asheville, excuse Asheville me. Shutters and you know, if, the, if those aliens come down and try to abduct me, they're at least going to be like, this guy defended us a little bit. So you three guys, I don't know what's going to happen to you guys. And they're going to be like, we listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is our only source of entertainment over the 900 billion light years that we've traveled to get here. Aww, That's They cute. look at you as they they look at you as the probe is slowly coming into the camera frame and they're just like, we took your advice. And it's just like automatic blinds moving up and down <laughs> inside of the sun. The probe is moving the we blinds. We love you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. But but I do I do want to give seriousness to, to Tom and Elise. I'll, of course. I'll yeah. Jokes aside about just the, the concept, it's some folks deal with intense trauma and, tem- and uh, intense situations with humor. That's how you cope. I, I do the same thing. I'm from the Midwest. I constantly joke about my own death, and I'm constantly looking at other folks just being like, are you okay? Is something wrong with you? And I'm like, no, dude, I'm from Ohio. Like, this is yeah, That's nah, what's wrong with me. It's normal. <laughs> this is normal where I'm from. Haven't you noticed most astronauts are from Ohio? We're all trying to get the fuck out of there. The Midwest, yeah. Um, first person on the moon first person in space the like majority of the astronauts are from ohio everybody's trying to get as far as possible away from that um all due respect ohio you're okay i would say you're a seven out of ten and you ain't gonna argue with me on that (laughs) um so (laughs) born and raised all right so i was just in ohio and there's some people in there that i really like Aw, I love even. We're doing our best to get him out. All right, so back to the story. Tom, on the other hand, was finding work meaningless. I bet. The stress-driven motivation of big projects and nonstop priorities felt as small as he was feeling. He was becoming sleepless and detached from everything. Struggling to come to terms with the experience, Tom would propose an idea. He wanted to do two things. The first, go back to the place where it all happened. Face the growing anxiety and look for any traces or clues left by the event. And the second, reach out to their parents. Tell them what they had experienced. To stop keeping it to themselves and be able to actually open up and talk about it to someone that they trust. Now, this sounds... The first one especially sounds very intense, very wild. Yeah, I can all go back. Mm -mm. No, this was in days. And like Tom was Tom was very, very well aware of like, I've completely lost everything I'm known for. I've lost myself. And and he was kind of struggling with an identity crisis, like with this new trauma coming in. And he's like, 
fuck that. I'm going to face it head on. I need to deal with this, right? So, and what we're about to dig into here, and I, I seriously, I can't appreciate this enough, and I, and I hope our audience does too, this is the trauma from these experiences. This is the trauma that gets washed over and ignored for the quote-unquote like juicy parts of the story, right? There is no technically like wrong way to deal with like trauma. He's trying to process it with literally no foundation at all anywhere. He can't find a book, can't find a person to talk to about what should he do. And so I'm not going to fault him that like these were his ideas. I'm not going to hate on Tom. This was him just in- instinctively being like, I feel like I have to. And he presents this idea to Elise, right? Well, shooting down the first idea is dangerous. Elise then approached the consequences of the second to tell their parents. She wanted to open up to them, but was scared of what they would think, that they would view her differently, treat her like she had lost her mind. Tom gently emphasized that none of these things needed to happen now. They were just directions he was leaning towards. He asked her to give it some time and to think about it. It was like a very sincere moment, honestly, reading through this. He's like, hey, this is what I, this is where I'm going in my feelings and in my thoughts right now. But I'm not forcing this on you, and I'm not saying it needs to happen now. This is just, these are ideas because we're both struggling to figure out what the fuck do we do with our lives right now, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. honestly, so, they both have great communication skills. Like from the beginning mm-hmm, of the yeah. story, just the way they've been communicating, it's like they have a very yeah. solid like relationship. And like fun facts, but they're like, I found out about this whole experience. I found about I found out about the Mojave incident, um, listening to old episodes of Coast to Coast. Um I heard an interview with Tom and Elise from 2016. Oh, wow. So this is all in oh, 1989. Wow. And it was a mutual interview with them in 2016. And they still, like, they, they, as far as I could tell with the way they were communicating and stuff, still together. Aww. And they do have really solid chemistry, you know? Mm-hmm. Soul um, mates. So, the, Soul mates. <laughs> yeah. So, like, um, this, this is an honest to God, like, loving couple you know Mm -hmm. that's trying to fucking handle some insane shit that they can't talk to anybody about um list the link of the interview for our people i can try i'm uh i'm gonna give a um an un um an unpaid advertisement i'm a coast to coast insider because um, <laughs> I'm constantly researching for our shows, so I'm digging back to shit from like 1990 and these old interviews. Um, and so I don't know if there's a free version for me to link to. I can give the name in the show notes, and I'll I'll do my best to remember to put that in. Yeah, I want to um, listen to it as well. <laughs> it's it's good. It was it was really interesting. Also, they don't sound anything like I pictured them sounding like. They didn't sound wrong or anything. Like, I didn't get any weird vibes from them. Like, I wasn't, it wasn't just like Tom came in and he's like, yeah, man. So I was like, uh, <laughs> anyways, the fuck you doing over there, alien? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like it didn't throw me off, you know? <laughs> but like, I was just like, ah, oh, I didn't picture that voice. Yeah, he um, came in there and was like, what's up, bruz? <laughs> he's uh, like, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just had a thick Boston accent. Yeah. I was like, what? what? <laughs> but, um, yeah. Oh, wait, they're from Boston? No. I thought they were in California. No, 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 they are. That was the joke. Oh. That, that was the joke. Was that it would be just really weird if all of a sudden they had a Boston mm-hmm. accent, but they're from fucking, like, California. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. So, that week, Elise called him out of the blue at work and told him she wants to give it a try. She got her brother to come babysit, and they left in the morning the very next day back to tabletop mountain they were both struggling to feel comfortable with their sanity but that was their real motivation to go back to get a sense of closure to at least know that yes it really did happen before they decided what steps they needed to take next when they finally made it there The moments flooded back into them. They walked through their memories as they scanned for marks and meaning around the canyon. At points, they would both experience flashbacks. Elise 
nearly fainting as the vision of Tom Jr. with his chest cut open came to her and Tom finding himself with new memories, memories of different kinds of lights, lights that looked like they were now leading somewhere. As for hard evidence, there was nothing. So they settled into the cab of the truck and began making their trip back home. Over the next few months, they'd both dive deeper into the side effects of the unanswered trauma. Known for being ambitious, dependable, and dedicated to the smallest details, Tom felt powerless as he struggled to care for what he used to take pride in. He was slipping up at work and now living every day with the fear of being fired. Elise, she took to isolation and fear, holding up all day at home along with her kids. She began avoiding contact with the family and friends she had cherished and always made plans with before it all happened. She wasn't going to make it easy for those beings to take and hurt her or their children. Once more, both Elise and Tom felt like the beings were still there, observing them. Was it paranoia? Honest awareness or a mixture of both? The truth is, nothing about the experience had given them an inch of familiar reality to work with. Oh my gosh. Like, I get it, but also, like, I'm not going to make it easy for them. We're all going to be in one spot all the time. <laughs> That's making it easy I mean, for like, them. <laughs> 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 Damn it. <laughs> but like but like after that, after like, you know, being tortured in the middle of fucking nowhere, like in her mind and forced to relive her most like intimate traumas and memories and experiences, like but then also valuing her kids more than her. You know? Yeah, I can also um, see like what do you do? I can see like taking <laughs> your kid you to the park do? or like being afraid to take your kid to the park. Because you're afraid to take your eyes off of them for a second. They're near a tree line, and then you never see them again. Mm -hmm. I would be walking like Michael Jackson used to walk with an umbrella. Like, everywhere. Like, bitch can't see me. Like, yeah. you know, just, like, yeah. everywhere. Like Michael Jackson <laughs> and children. What do you mean? They both come up in Google searches. Um, so... Anyways. I get that though. I would I just I just I don't know. Do like they to me they Google they searches together, sorry. Yes, that's what I mean. Okay, because I was gonna that ask how often do you Google <laughs> children? <laughs> I Google Michael Jackson they often. They both work on Google um, guys. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Betsy Bay? Sorry. Um to me they are so brave um like yes. the more the more i'm i'm hearing about them and just the way they're handling everything with such like mm -hmm. like it's crazy because it's like they went through something that you cannot explain but they they are also handling this like pros in a way like like the way their heads are so like okay this is what happened this is how i feel and this is how i think i want to deal with it and it's just like yeah. really amazing how they can still even think about this and take care of their family, take care of each other, take care of themselves. Yes. Like, I honestly yes. don't think I could survive something like that. Like, Dude. it's insane. Dude, yeah. And like, and the, yeah, and like straight up, that's that's what I, I don't know if I made it clear enough in like their communication stuff, because I was kind of looking at it as like a long story, like coming into it early on. But like, I'm, but in this part of the story, the the episode or the series like i really wanted to kind of like show like hey this is the reality of this <laughs> like i've never come across this and like you know they might make mistakes and guess what you haven't uh an intense trauma it doesn't matter if it's extraterrestrial or not it's going to affect your life <laughs> i'm like congratulations you found out that if something really bad happens to you it might cause you to not perform as well at work, which also doesn't give a fuck about you. Um, you know, like, it's going to affect things. But, like, the way that Elise and Tom are handling it, they're they're being proactive. They're trying to find solutions. Solution, yeah. and, and And they're not just, like, jumping on whatever idea that comes up. They're taking time to respectively step back and be like, I don't agree with that. I feel fear about that. I feel this. I feel that. Which in some way 
almost shows the reality of how they're both consumed by their thoughts in the meantime between these communications, right? So, like, Tom eventually came to the conclusion, hey, we should go back, we should face it, also we should reach out to our parents, they're our most trusted folks, which entailed that he also thought about who can we both agree on in our own personal lives, separate from each other, that we can talk to about this thing we're we're suffering with, right? Like, Tom was putting a lot of thought into this. And Elise, she was just going nuts trying to learn and obsess and research everything about it, which I can relate to. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so, like, and, and, and so that was that path that she went. Either path wasn't wrong. They were different. And the way that they they would hesitate, and they will hesitate back and forth with, with next steps around things, um, shows that they're both at maintaining their autonomy, right? Their independence, um, as well as actively trying to be proactive about this. They know something's wrong. They know this fucked with them. And like, again, this shit doesn't get talked about, which is why I want to give light to this because I'm just like, damn, here's an example of people suffering from this. And they're doing a lot of really good things. Like, they're, they're being proactive. They're handling it, you know? Yeah, but. I do like that, that they see there's a problem and they're trying to find a solution because, like, obviously they want things to get better, you know, for, for their family. Mm -hmm. Like, they're taking care of each other and their kids, obviously. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm just, like, really impressed. And, I mean, I guess that's why they're still together because they're both so yeah. good at communicating and taking care of each other. Because that's and their I, goal. <laughs> I w um I didn't include this in the script and it isn't a spoiler. But I will say so so Elise was raised um uh Mormon. Oh yeah. Right. Um super religious, um, not just because she was Mormon, but she was super religious and Mormon, right? Tom, not so much. He really wasn't like uh let's just say like of the faith. Right. He wasn't like a full blown like atheist. He was an agnostic. Definitely was like, you know, I pray to God when shit gets bad. But I he wasn't a churchgoer. Right. Um, at least grew up like seeing in choir, really being a part of all that. Tom at a point in the book literally says, I became Mormon. He converted to Mormonism. Aww. To help maintain and support and be close to Elise. Like, straight up, that's a point in, in their struggle with things. He's like, I did this um, because I believe in God, da 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 but also this was important to her. I didn't and like I him, stay with and her. now I, I love him. <laughs> that Yeah, and that's uh, the first episode when y'all were like, yes. bashing, I was like, you it's don't not, know what happens. A, <laughs> it's not all about the <laughs> spa, so guys. Good. He, Aww. you know, he ain't perfect. He ain't perfect, but he when he gets a when the idea comes through, he he tries and he he does he does good. He, the mm. man does good. <laughs> Anyways, back to the story. Sorry with all the rambling, folks, but but I wanted to give you a little inside note. Now we need um, a special <clears throat> episode just for Tom. <laughs> God damn it! This is not going to be a four part series. <laughs> part Yo, four. Let me Tom. let me write about something else for the love of God. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why do you chain me in the basement? And make me do this <laughs> because we refuse um, to read books. <laughs> all right then you're gonna love the ending okay um <clears throat> anyways once more both elise and tom felt like the beings were still there observing them was a paranoia honest awareness or a mixture of both the truth is nothing about the experience had given them an inch of familiar reality to work with realizing that night had left them feeling broken they admitted it was time to reach out and talk to someone this part of the story, to me, is an important lesson for two reasons. The first, it's from the experiencer's point of view. The shame, guilt, and fear they feel opening up to the very people they trust the most. Doesn't matter if it's your parents or not. The point is, is that to them, these were the folks in their lives that they trusted with everything. And these are all the emotions that they felt going into those conversations. And the second, an example of how you should and shouldn't respond to someone vulnerable telling you about their trauma, even if it's hard for you to believe. 
Opportunity fell to Elise's parents first, John and Vivian. With the kids tucked away sleeping in another room, worn out from hanging out all day with their grandparents, Tom and Elise sat at her parents' house quietly that evening after dinner. Taking a sip of coffee, she leaned forward. Quote, Tom and I wanted to talk to you about something very private. Something we've told no one else about. End quote. With the comforting reassurance, Vivian tried to let her know whatever it is, it's okay. They can tell them. At least started from the beginning. How they saw the lights. Her mom almost immediately asked if it was a UFO. Elise choked back anxiety as she shook her head. Yes, it was. Vivian then went on to mention a recent movie that had came out, Communion. Elise responded, yes. Unsure if it ever ended, she told them, Tom and her were experiencing was similar to that. Softly, John spoke up. Are you saying you were abducted? Is this serious? Are you messing with us right now? A long silence floated in. He sat, staring at Elise, unsure how to take this. And then it hit him. That look, her eyes, the emotion. He had only seen it on her face once before. The day she ran to him as a child after she'd been raped. Y'all about to make me tear up. Quote, they hurt you, didn't they? She nodded in pain. End quote. I'm gonna cry. (laughs) Yeah, dude, it's it's fucking rough Um, filled with pen and rage she spoke confidently through tears telling her parents everything after hours of emotional listening the four found silence had joined them again oof sorry gotta wipe tears y'all it's it's a really heavy part of the book um It was hard to tell when the conversation had stopped and when their mind began processing what they had just heard. A pressure to respond nudged on first, quote, I believe that you believe this happened. He'd go on to admit it was hard to comprehend as possible, and in an honest, reassuring way, he said, quote, I love you more than everything, darling. But there's got to be some other explanation. No. This is hard. F- th- it's. Mm. Tom snapped back. Do you think we're lying? John replied calmly, no. And then said he thinks they're being truthful to what they believed happened. Vivian would then bring up the possibility that uh, maybe it was a military experiment, a jet, or a rocket. Tom countered with all the other details, and the conversation continued to become more and more heated. John, trying to bring down the temperature, reassured them that they were only trying to understand and only trying to help. And and I gotta say, like, to go off script for a second, they honestly were. Like, the getting away from summarizing all the dialogue like they were seriously just like what the fuck did our kid just say to us (laughs) and like we're really trying here to comprehend this but like let's look at it this way we cover alien stories and abductions and shit like that constantly and we're still like what the fuck (laughs) you know let alone in 1989 right and they're just they're he was trying like, I, I ain't going to fault anybody here. This is new ground for everybody because this shit doesn't get covered, doesn't get talked about. Like, they weren't trying to well, be mean or disrespectful to what they were sharing. Yeah, like, they straight up didn't know, like, 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 hey, we don't know what to say right now. 
You know, we we believe that you're feeling this, that you've went through this, but also how the fuck is any of this possible? We're struggling with that moment right there. Yeah. Our kid just walked up and said that they saw some crazy ass shit happen and we're like, we believe you, sweetie, but like, that's not real. That's not, po- what? You know, in the exact, and, and in defense, that's exactly how Tom and Elise felt before all of this. If you would have went to Tom and Elise and and told them this story, they might have responded the same way. So how how on earth could their parents respond any differently, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and this is the struggle of these moments. Well, Elise responded, you can help us by believing what we're telling you is the truth. John replied, telling her, they see how upset they are. And emphasize, quote, we still love you and are going to support you in any way we can. Fucking solid parenting. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> like That's some solid ass parenting right there. Well, it ain't and none of this can be perfect for anybody. But I, I, I felt like that was a good response. Yeah. Well, by the time they. Right. By the time they were leaving, the tone was calm, but feelings were honestly still unsettled. On the way out, Vivian kept telling them how much they loved them, while Tom told John he can't agree with hearing it doesn't matter if it happened or not. It did, and it does matter. These are all, these are fucking honest responses here. Well, that night, Tom and Elise would wake to outlines of shadows standing next to their bed. No, I cannot with yeah. that. <laughs> Your face. Both <laughs> both of them, unsure. Sorry, I just wrote that line for Beth's Bay. Um, <laughs> both of them, unsure if it was a dream until they heard a scream come from the children's room. Mm-mm-mm. They ran in and found Tom Jr. still asleep, Standing in the corner, spinning around what and the? around and around in circles. Oh my god! I, I that, would punt that's that kid. Wrong. <laughs> no, I'd be like, "You okay?" That's a terrible Smack. response. <laughs> Stop, Stop it! Stop that! <laughs> oh god! I need to use. Stop condoms. it! All right. So- <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ashton Kutcher popped in the door and he was like, You've been punked! Uh, God damn it, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is like it's veering terrible. on some like poltergeist yeah. shit. Yeah. Like this is like starting to veer <laughs> No, that's some demon shit right there. Yeah, that's like demon. figures around yeah. your bed. Like Mm-mm. I can't say it because you told us I... when we weren't recording. But something you said, <laughs> well, like I, I I lay in bed and then I like peek one eye open and I'm like all right. That's what I did when <laughs> Joey was gone. I when we did this episode, Joey left, and I was by myself, and I couldn't sleep because I kept like opening my eyes, you know, because of this. <laughs> like no, just no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of this entire series when I said this will literally be nightmare juice. Yep. I coined that phrase, and I feel like it's accurate. And then it he is. winked at us, too, after that. He was like, wait, <laughs> <laughs> Manufactured at home. <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough, winked with both eyes. Couldn't tell if it was a blink. <laughs> <laughs> both eyes are different Sponsored by Quasga's Automatic Blinds. <laughs> I, was, I read too much. Um, <clears throat> okay. Anyways, back to the shock. When the initial shock left, they approached their son and took him slowly back to his bed. He woke up, asking, quote, Mommy, what's wrong? No. She, she lied and said it was nothing. And made that oh, face. This fucking... So he dude, was... this moment... He was... This moment was fucked. He was crying, <laughs> sleeping in the corner, spinning... Oh no, he wasn't. He wasn't crying. Didn't he they was, hear him cry? He was dead. 
No, 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 no. They heard a scream, a scream. Oh. Come from the bedroom. They had no clue because uh, Zoe and Tom Jr. both shared a room. They just knew it was coming from the children's room. They ran in out of bed. At first, like, it was kind of like if, um, you know, if if one of us wakes up and we're in bed with the other one, so, like, and we're, like, neither one of us is aware that the other person's awake and we're both just kind of trying to fall back asleep kind of a thing. But if we both recognize something's in the room, we're seeing this, like, just a just an outline. Th- this story gets so fucked up that we're just just glossing over the fact that they saw shadow kind of figures in their room literally against their bed standing that fucking it wasn't like way in the corner it was like standing against the goddamn bed uh, yeah. it was that fucking close <laughs> and and they both woke up they both recognized it but they both weren't sure if they were dreaming and then they both heard a scream and you know parentalism like kicked up and they were like shit jump the fuck up run towards my kid screaming right and that's when they realized there was no transition between seeing the things and running towards the scream in their children's room that like they didn't process this until later that like they were both awake looking at this as nerves calmed and their son fell back asleep Elise and Tom stood outside the children's room and kept watch when they finally felt like things would be okay she reached in to switch off the bedroom light The moment she turned to walk away, her son shot up in bed, quote, Don't turn off the light. Why? Because when you do, the the little monsters come. No, get out of here. Thomas, there, there are no little monsters. But there are, Mommy, there are. They're short and ugly, and they have red eyes. Oh, God, those things. Those little demons. They were were listening. You can't just gaslight your son. You can't be like, no, honey. Yeah. That's I know, it's like, really? I'd be like, let's turn all the fucking lights on in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially because they know which little monsters are. (laughs) Yeah, I would never turn off the light. Ever. (laughs) Mm -mm. Yeah. I'd have a flashlight strapped to my forehead. Mm-hmm. It, it's just a headlamp. Yeah, yeah that thing. You don't no, know. she would have That's a flashlight duct taped to <laughs> like her a forehead. Like a unicorn. Yeah. I want to <laughs> oh feel beautiful, God. okay? <laughs> God damn Unlike it. those aliens. Back to the script. <laughs> I'm wrangling you all up. I'm wrangling the kitties. We're going back to the script. <laughs> Months later, the time came to share the details of the night in the Mojave to Tom's parents. By now, all you had to do was look at Tom and Elise to see something was wrong. Both of them sporting sunken eyes with dark bags, both plagued by regular nightmares, and both disturbed by the regular visits they were experiencing. Since the incident with Tom Jr., Elise was now fully wrapped in paranoia. Her fears were coming true, and there didn't seem to be any way to keep their kids safe from the beings. As they got closer to Tom's parents' house, he could feel himself getting worked up and growing more nervous. His dad, Wolfie, wasn't exactly known for the same calm demeanor that Elise's dad, John, was. And if John had a hard time accepting the story and believing them, he couldn't imagine Wolfie to even come close. Once they arrived, the small talk was brief. Within minutes, Wolfie said, quote, You know, I can probably save us all a lot of time, end quote, as he motioned them towards the couch. Let's first, uh, sit down. I think I know why you're here. I, I don't get it, retorted Tom. Carol, Tom's mom, rushed to Wolfie's aid. What he means is, Whoopi stopped her. I know what I mean. People are concerned about you. You look like hell. No one sees you anymore. End quote. Cooling down a moment, Whoopi went on to tell them, quote, We talked to Elise's folks, and better yet, I think I may know the answer to your problem. 
What problem? Elise asked. The UFOs, the extraterrestrials, all of that. End quote. He went on to tell them how they'd probably just seen the military exercises from the nearby bases, then held up his hand when Elise started to say no. Like he straight up shut her up. Wow. He continued, insisting that they mistook jets and helicopters for the lights and soldiers in night vision goggles for the creatures with red eyes. This is so, like, I love this book and I love this story so much because, like, it, it just gave me a different perspective on every time I hear shit getting debunked. And, like, it was just this, it was just that. And it's just like, how do those people feel? <laughs> right. Well, understandably, Tom shot back saying, no. He then tried to make it clear that the craft that they saw in no way came from any military. Elise stepped up and Elise stepped up and said, "And the beings, the beings themselves, Wolfie, they they weren't human." Anything else? Wolfie inquired. "Yes," said Elise. It still goes on. They're everywhere. They're watching us, monitoring every thought, every motion, and we see them. Never really close up and clear like in the desert that night, but we see them. End quote. Elise would go on to briefly tell them about the shadows appearing in their room at night, the dark eyes staring at them when they wake up in the middle, or when they wake up in the middle of the night. All of the shit that's been going on. She she tried to just summarize that the best that she could and just be like, dude, this is not a military experiment. Experiment. This is not uh, night vision goggles in the desert. These aren't jets. Like this is still going on. This is tormenting us. Carol responded, "Quote, we know what you mean, dear. <laughs> we understand." End quote. By now, even Wolfie was taken back. Partially in shock by the level of commitment Tom and Elise had on, had when they were insisting on what they had seen. Calmer than the first time, he reluctantly went on to tell them a story he had once heard. An experiment the military had done back in the day that sounds, honestly, a lot like something from NK Ultra. Was was um, that was that Wolfie that that told them that or was that Tom? It was Wolfie. Okay, Wolfie okay, was still sure, yeah. Wolfie was still pushing the narrative around like um, it was the military because there were it, yeah within like uh forty sixty and I think like a hundred miles of this grand expanse of the desert, which is like two hundred something miles long or five hundred or whatever crazy amount. Um, there were military bases, right? So this was kind of central to those three points. And Wolfie was trying to step in and just kind of be like, no, 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 you're mistaken. It had to be some military shit. Right? Actually, we have uh, one of our listener, one of our really important listeners uh, that listened to our last episode saying that they also thought that it was the government experimenting with people so they could talk to a different dimension or something like that that they were doing back in the day. Can you explain it better, uh, what Victoria said? Yeah, that they were feeding them psychedelics to basically get to very much like the MK Ultra program and that they were just testing to see what kind of drugs did what, if they could uh, uh, remote view like they were trying to do with the MK Ultra program. So, Yeah. And so... If this was a single person on their own, um, and we're, we're kind of d- going to dip into this later in the script. Um, if this is a single person on their own, I could lend more credence to that. But that's not how psychedelics work. Just straight up. You know, like, if you, Joey, start taking uh, vitamins every day and supplements and all these things like that, it doesn't do a damn thing for Betsabe. Right? If Selena and I took the exact same amount of psychedelics, or even uh, in some crazy world, the same amount to have the same effect of psychedelics for our bodies, 
we would have different trips. You do not have the exact same trip. You might have different points where you're triggered, right? You might have different points where you see something and you both agree, well, that's trippy or that's this um, or any number of things. But the fact is, is like you don't have eight hours of the exact same experience. Like, so it rules out drugs. Like it just, it inherently, it's like drugs don't make sense here because girl, put that shit down <laughs> for the love of God. I'm sorry. I love you, Betsy Bay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just like so nervous. I'm going to drive over to your house and pop that motherfucker. No. <laughs> You guys are just gonna see me leave for a second and pop up in the other camera, just like stabbing. <laughs> just, just, Pops into my camera, pets Bonbon, bon and then leaves and pops back in his camera. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to walks up, takes a sip of Joey's beer, <laughs> leaves. Why empty. are you mad at you me? Just throw the mattress off the day bed, start stabbing yeah. the pillows, <laughs> punch a hole in the window, and leave. <laughs> A I, I, lot of anger issues you guys have never told me about. Well, I do. <laughs> um, I do want to ask. Like, so it, yeah. this is Tom's dad, Wolfie, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So was t- was Tom's dad religious, or does it say, or does it make any mention? Uh, I don't remember anything. I don't think so because Wolfie. I mean, Wolfie Tom is not. Yeah, but well, usually I mean, that my, does. My mom is Christian, but I'm not. It usually true, does true, happen true. to where, like, if the parents are super religious, the kid and kids end up being not. I mean, not always, obviously, but like, I would think, and I'm and I'm kind of wondering too why they didn't just go. Well, maybe you saw demons, like, because that's a pretty, especially with. I don't know if I'm saying something ahead of time, but like, oh. what if they were just like, what if, what if they? I would. I'm. I was expecting uh, Tom's dad to say, Wolfie to say, these are. It demons. depends on the flavor of Christianity. My mom um, would say that. Some people would like believe that and be like, oh my God, you need to have like an exorcism or we need to come bless the house. But there are other people that are like, eh, that's not really like, we don't think that that happens. Like, we think things happen more behind the scenes. Mm. So, so like, and this is a part we're about to come up to, like, literally, next line. Um, but, um, they they do start to discuss this like um basically his story or tom and elisa's story versus the the theory of it being some sort of super secret advanced military training experiment exercise thing out in the middle of the desert right they they do they do hit that um but but to just continue the thought so so basically Tom's dad, Wolfie, starts to break down um a story similar to stuff that you would hear from any case report with MK Ultra. Um government took somebody who uh was owned by the government, aka anybody that's in the military, right? You're owned by the government if you're in the military. That's part of the giant bonus you get is you sign away your rights. Um any branch, basically. You're owned by the goddamn government until your service is through. That's why it's called the goddamn service, right? Um, they will... You're in a lot of trouble if you don't show up. Let me put it that way. So, it's it, it's hard. Um, <clears throat> anyways, they took somebody. And to continue the quote, um, the test that they ran on him ended up reducing um, an unsuspecting father of two to an almost comatose state, he had to, quote, be toilet trained. His mind had been reduced to a complete blank, end quote. So the shit that they ran on this dude that Wolfie was aware of way back in the day, completely fucked. Like, he was completely fucked. Whoa. Um, And he was aware of the story, and he was like, hey, maybe this is what happened to you two out in the desert. Okay. And, and both, um, uh, both of Tom's parents were both just like, God damn it. Like, fuck. Like they, they believed that 
the kids ex- or their kids, you know, um, that Tom and Elise experienced something, and they were actually like pissed about it, right? They honestly believe something took place. They weren't listening. They were doing a shit job at listening to what Tom and Elise were saying, but they did give them enough credit to say that like something happened. They just didn't listen enough to actually hear what happened. So Tom and his dad talked over this idea about how maybe they were victims of a military psyops test. The theory was interesting, but ultimately insulting and impossible the number of misidentifications that would have needed to have happened and the fact that they would need, that they would have needed to have both had identical hallucinations. It's, it's maddening. It's just like, it's an insulting theory to put towards somebody that's saying something like this to you. Well, by the end of the conversation, Wolfie tried to speak sense into them in his own Wolfie way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> reminding them that it, had, that it had been seven months since it happened. They needed to chill, appreciate the nice weather, oh to my relax God. <laughs> for their kids' sake. And if they don't feel better by the summer, they should find professional help. Wow. Well, I mean, that's the only one thing good he said is to f- find professional help, but he screwed up on every, literally every other thing he said. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it seems like <laughs> yeah. by telling them to get professional help, he's insinuating that they're mentally ill. Uh, yeah. yeah. True. Not trauma counseling. There's a, l- but... there's a lot of shit wrong with this where it's just like, and I and I did want to cover the like the, the the nuances. Yeah. Like, and. <laughs> no, that's terrible. I mean, it's like it could be good for a couple of, like Elise and Tom who are like motivated to keep progressing through realizing things. Like, I don't disagree with the concept of a timeline delivery. Terrible, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, you know, could have been put in a much subtler, um, empathetic way, where it's just like, hey, if y'all aren't da 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 da, and you don't feel comfortable talking about it to other folks by da 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 da, you should consider getting help. That's a solid way to approach something. Yeah. Also, so, like none of them were like, time- "What can we do to help?" Yeah, What's I mean, that? you can't set a timeline on someone else's processing of a trauma. You can't no, say no, no, you no. can't say like, you know, you have until the summer to start feeling better. Otherwise, I think something's really wrong. You got to go see someone. Like, you know, like again, I don't know. Again, his delivery was shit the basic concepts were kind of like in a woofy sort of way. That was the most feelings I feel like he could have felt, (laughs) you know, whereas like he was trying to be since again, uncharted waters for everybody, you know, (laughs) like, and this might've been the most accepting that Tom ever saw his dad, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like that's kind of the vibe that I got was he was just like, God damn it. I can't believe this was my idea. Like the whole drive there. And then they got there. Then this was it. And there was a bunch of other conversation and shit around it. Um, Well, think about it. Like if they had done it backwards though, you know, Mm because at first they went to her mom's and dad's house Mm -hmm. and then they went to, his dad's and mom's house and like think if they had gone to his parents house first i feel like they wouldn't have gone to the other parents house after seeing how they reacted to it they probably wouldn't have gone to that parents house because they're just like well they're they just don't believe us but at least in her parents they were like what can we do to what can we do for you you know at the end of it yeah they were like we think it could be something else but we're we're here for you we want to know like what we can do for you and that's like a, a super accepting way to say something you know to 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 listen to somebody but they're just just his parents are just like <laughs> well i think you're completely wrong and you're mental <laughs> and you're mental <laughs> and you're mental and, like, yeah. and you can't talk not done yet yeah, yeah. yeah. It's my couch you're it's sitting on. I can remember that. You see me there? <laughs> I can tell you what. Uh, I don't think Tom would have been offended by uh, John's statement earlier on the way out the door <laughs> if they would have went to his parents' house first. Yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> like, they would have been like, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Some rational people. But, 
But I did want to lay it out and approach it in this way um, for the simple fact that we first picked apart the the nuances of um, of Elisa's parents. And we we're like, oh, that's kind of fucked up. Oh, da, 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 da. And that's that end of the spectrum. This is the other end that, that, frankly, a lot of folks would have to deal with. Yeah. Which is just like, you need fucking help. Bro, so- chill the fuck out. Look outside. It's spring and shit. Think about your babies. Anyways, you got until the summer, motherfucker. Like, it's like, <laughs> damn, dude. Like, terrible fucking, like, communication skills. I don't care if you're a parent or not. This is just a shit way to talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's still being a parent to, it's talking does not give you a blank they're... slate to be a dick to your kid. Yeah, talking to your kid as if it's your property. Yeah. It's like your emotions are an inconvenience to me. Move the fuck on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's just like, damn, dude. And what's what's <laughs> like, crazy is like what you describe, like, too, with his parents obviously should know that, like, they raised a good kid. You know, they raised a decent kid like Tom. Like he he's great at work. <clears throat> he never really yeah. had problems. He married somebody like they don't have problems. They're raising good kids themselves. Like there's no. Yeah. In society's view, there's no, there's nothing wrong with them, you know. In society's view, they're they're yeah. living a great life, and yet they come with this one thing, like, "Hey, I just want to let you know, I've never came back and lied to you, you know. I've never come back and we don't have these bad lives. I'm not like some hoodlum, you know, doing drugs in the street. He's like, this, we went out to have a nice weekend to go hunting instead of the spa, and we just." <laughs> And we just had this horrible thing. And well, and his dad's just yes. like, no. Talk to the hand in my house. This is what yeah. you need to do. And I think that that, like, it says something about the dad, you know, that. Yes. Because I don't know about the, you know, the mom was probably, he was probably just like, don't talk. So with, yeah. which is kind of just like, okay, it says something about the dad being like, look, if you think that you raised your kid right, Shouldn't you just believe him? That's that's the key <laughs> point there. Um, and yeah, like I, that's that's the key fucking point. It's Wolfie's insecurities that are coming through, and the reason why he can't believe his own son. Like the reason why he's having an issue with what his son, who was trained and raised and looks up to him, and is coming to him in confidence, right? And he's aware he's only the third, fourth person to ever hear this shit after seven or eight months. And he can't accept that from somebody that he brought up. That's because he's fucking insecure. It's because he can't trust him because he can't trust his goddamn self. Not to go too deep on that, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that's a problem with Wolfie. Thank you so much for listening to the Black Cat Report and the Mojave Incident Part 3. Can you imagine telling your parents about this? Please like, review, and follow wherever you get your podcasts. We are so excited for the new year and the new content we'll have coming out this year. Enjoy the rest of the incident. Over the next few months, the dreams and encounters would continue, sometimes more intense than others. Fear became a lifestyle as paranoid thoughts replaced much of the personality they had once been known for. Whereas on the night of the encounter, they were quickly driven through the levels of their own personal hell. Now, they were slowly falling through it, aware and watching themselves held out by the constant torment and the new traumas that they were experiencing. The conversation with Tom's parents had been in May. It was now August, and Tom was at the bar with one of his closest friends, Paul Moran, Best friend since college, Tom didn't get to see Paul too often, even before his social life slipped into disarray. It didn't take long before Paul managed to pull the thread that was holding down the Tom he knew. Still dealing with the impact of his own parents not believing him, but feeling more comfortable now, Tom began to open up about why it was so important that they met up and had that evening together. He proceeded to work through the entire story with Paul sitting patiently 
hanging on every single word. <clears throat> By the time Tom was done, he began getting feelings of insecurity. They were building up inside of him. He started to feel like he was a burden. Aww. This was brief, though. Paul looked him dead in the eyes and said, I believe you. Oh my god, Aww. what a friend! Paul's a goddamn Gross. angel. Yeah. Unsure, Tom started asking if he meant it, if he thinks he's gone crazy. Paul fired back telling Tom he trusts him. That's why he believes him. Aww. Fucking solid. Yeah. <laughs> like solid as response. He reassured him that, quote, 99% of what we take for granted as real is either a bunch of scientists kidding themselves or delusion. He'd go on to quote all of the major fuck-ups and assumptions humans have been making for the past 500 or so years. The Earth is flat. 300 years ago, the Earth was the center of the universe, and right now Newton's laws of physics are being disproved. In short, he was reminding Tom that just because he feels alone in his experience doesn't mean he's detached from reality. Sometimes, actually often, it just means our next big social assumption hasn't caught up with what he's found out to be real. Tom smiled. Wow, Dang. I know. <laughs> but I can it just I can just imagine how he's saying it too cuz he's probably just like in Einstein's theory of relativity, no. it wasn't no. even gained. <laughs> no. Just no. wasted. And, but like, but I love you, man. And I trust you. <laughs> and like, frogs are weird. Can frogs we all are weird. Agree? Let's yeah. agree to that. <laughs> Tom, you're the greatest, and I love you. <laughs> What's your name, Mark? Mark. Oh yeah, Tom. I love you, man. <laughs> no, no, but like, but Paul, a great Paul dude. was a real motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah, what a what a great man. Yep. Um, but but yeah, for the first time in like months and months and months, like this has almost been a year at this point. Tom actually smiled. Aww. It connected. Like Aww. it went through the way that Paul responded, what Paul said, and like and there was a lot. I'm I'm really what just paraphrasing here too. some of the stuff mm -hmm. that he said. Paul actually was like, Yes. Yes, I don't care how fucking insane this is. He literally said at one point, if I can't believe you, I can't believe anyone. Wow. Like he just straight up and it was just like, damn. Wow. Like the significance of this moment. So naturally one of the one of the next things that came up in conversation was Paul asked how he could help. There, that's what's been missing. No one's been like, How can I help? How can I make this easier for you? Is there something I can do? No one has. Well, her, his, no. his parents, parents did. Her parents uh, did. Parents. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Paul's true. the first person to at least run two bases, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If this was baseball. I don't know any other rules besides home run. bases. I think he hit a home run, yeah. You're right. That's a home so, yeah, run. Yeah, like two six bases. home runs. His, he had a grand <laughs> slam. Pretty sure, bases. pretty sure he his got a His parents field goal. didn't make it off the mat. <laughs> they got struck yeah, out. No. They struck out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, how so, awesome that Tom reached out to a friend to talk about this because I feel like, especially men, it's so hard for them to talk to other people about how they're feeling and stuff. Yeah. And he had the mm -hmm. courage to be like, "I need a friend right now." Yeah, and 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 yeah, and like it was, it was still like months after what happened, and it kind of shows that even though Tom was definitely like you know like bury my feelings move on work 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 like yeah. kind of shit it still took him months to reach out to his friend and even when he did he directly said like it's it's quoted in the book he directly said like i don't mean to burden you with this mm -hmm. even my own parents don't believe me it was still eating at him the way that like uh, the way that his mom and dad had responded it was fucking with him which, yeah like, especially your own parents. honestly yeah, like, what kind of heart, like, I don't care if you're, like, I'm a man or not, like, what kind of heartless piece of shit are you if, like, your parents saying something like that doesn't bother you? Yeah. Like, what does, dude? 
Like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, what are you? Like, I would hope your parents could get to you or else you just literally don't have emotions, dude. <laughs> um, I mean, so, like, parents aren't the best people. Yeah. Totally. 100%. 100% I agree with you. But but we struggle with the fact that our parents aren't the best people still. Yeah. I would say most of the time people still like, it's still a thing that we're trying to recognize that we're trying to overcome, that we're trying to accept that we're like it. It's a big deal that like his parents who like he wasn't on bad terms with to really put this in perspective. It was his idea to go to their parents and he knew how his parents were. So he still felt close enough to them to propose that idea. Like, so I, I ain't even, I don't even want to just put it in the perspective of like just parents, but just like anybody where he would just be like, Hey, you know, talk to your best friend. I don't know, Valerie, who are the fuck, you know, like he didn't say that he said our parents because he knew for both of them that like they were the closest ones to him that they could trust. And that like, if they went to them with some wingnut ass shit, they wouldn't disown them. They wouldn't, you know, like treat them differently. They they would love them. They would embrace them like parents should. And like, so months later, he's struggling, and he he reached out to Paul, right? And Paul fucking came through for the win. So yeah. yep, I, Paul, what a Paul, hero. Oh. I'm wondering if, with him talking to both their parents and and both of them kind of being like, the first one was like, hey, you know, I I don't believe you they pretty much said like i i don't believe you you know we know what you saw but they said what can we what can we do to help you know they had half of it like you're saying and the other parents just yeah. missed completely cuz they said we don't believe you and you need help so i'm wondering if yeah. like thinking and you about have 6 months <laughs> think yeah and 6 months think about tom's mindset of like these are the people who raised me my dad's mm-hmm. very rational and i guess mm-hmm. in a in a bad way, he's so rational, you know, because he's like, I'm going to be more rational than anybody there ever was to exist because he's like, yeah. you're wrong, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I wonder if he was reaching out to Paul as like his last kind of like a, not really a last ditch effort, but kind of like an effort to be like, Hey, maybe if my like old friend believes me, then maybe I do have something. Or if he kind of says I'm crazy, maybe I do need to search for something, you know, like maybe he, that was kind of his rationale. Yeah. And it, it definitely may have been, I, I definitely think it was like him going down the checklist because his parents failed him so miserably. <clears throat> um, Like the, the whole thing, honestly, one of the lowest blows to me wasn't even just like Woofy's expected reaction. <laughs> it was, um, it was his mom just being, it was his mom just kind of being like, oh, we understand, honey. Like, just like totally just being like, yeah, we get it. Anyways, like, it's just like, what the literal fuck? Like, you just heard three hours of the most horrifying thing you've ever heard, by the way, um, coming from your kids' mouths. And you're just like, yeah, we get it. Anyways, we love you. It's just like, did you hear anything I just said? <laughs> you know, like, that's like a, oof drop the baby moment you know like that's that's bad um i don't know that would hit me if my mom said that to me i'd be like mom what the fuck <laughs> like yeah you know, eh, shit hurts you know i hate and, when like, people woof. do that right like and, it like, just pisses me off and yeah and i i i think that like paul was definitely kind of like his next step it, it had been months and i I can only imagine, you know, I can only speculate about, like, what was going through his mind with, like, um, okay, so we got Elise's parents out of the way. And, again, this is, like, his idea, right? So he had to feel some ownership over this granting some type of progress, some type of closure to what they were experiencing. But at this point, like, they straight up looked like zombies. They would look fucked up. Like, they had bags under their eyes. They weren't sleeping. You know, like, they weren't talking to anybody. Like, they were, like, their lives were falling apart, right? Like, even on the way to, like, um, uh, to go to his parents' house, he got a call from somebody at work who was, like, pissed at him. And it was, like, a continuation of, like, his fears of, like, I'm going to get fired. Like, he just totally lost his personality, everything that everybody knew and relied on him for, and he was struggling with it. 
And then his parents treat him like that. It's just like, God damn, dude, I can't yeah. find relief anywhere, <laughs> you know? And so, so we hit up his friend and it, it may have been a last resort. Um, he may have had six, seven, eight, nine more people that he would have hit up. But the point is, is like, these are, at least to me, like, these are examples of how to respond, right? If somebody came at you with like some shit happened, da 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 da, go hit up this book and just read these three parts, <laughs> yeah, and just get some ideas about like yes, yes, oh fuck no, no no no, oh yes, oh I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it like that, you know, like you know what I'm saying, like make it your own, but like, but we have no training <laughs> in how to respond to these things, and that's that was what was most appealing to me, like reading through this and. Paul fucking pulled through and y'all y'all love Paul now. I'm wondering how you're going to feel in a moment. So, oh, Paul. <laughs> so, so Paul asked how he could help. Tom assured him it, it literally wasn't possible. And honestly, from Paul's point of view, how the fuck is anybody helping them possible? Yeah. Like, what What are you going to, what are you going to do? Figure out a way for them to not come through the walls at night and fuck with us while we're sleeping and torment our kids and give us nightmares. Like, okay. So you know? not that, so, but maybe like they can build like a, what do they call it? Like a rotation thing where like one night, one day, <laughs> like a so, night watch, like a night watch. Yeah. I mean, All- that will help me honestly. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I did think when Joey so was these... gone, I thought about reaching out to someone to just come Aww. and just stay like a, like a guard, you know. Girl, we live like four miles away. You can come stay at our house. You guys were like, gone Selena too. I, I would have told you where our spare key was. I you could, you have, could have stayed at our all house of those and keys. you could have been in the room with three with cats. Willow and she would have loved all over you the whole time. Well, I oh have Bon Bon too, so. <laughs> And then, two, and then two and then two black figures alone. probably get along. And then two black figures jumping around the room making noise. <laughs> no. yeah. But you know who they are. It's yeah. Dada and <laughs> Salem. Um so so Tom assured him that it, it wasn't possible to help him. Can't blame the dude. It's been over a year at this point since everything happened. He's still struggling with Oof. it. It's fucking with him. It's fucking with him enough that he set up a special time and date to go meet an old friend from college just to discuss this a year later. That's, that's pretty heavy. So anyways, the, the conversation went on until Tom had to make the hour and a half drive back to his house. Oh, a long drive. And now we cue the author of the source of this series, Ron Felber. It was just two months later in November that Ron was meeting up with an old friend he'd worked with for five years. His good friend, Paul Moran. <gasps> what? No. <laughs> I got to be friends with everybody. <laughs> I know. Because he's such a good friend. Like, That's why. Shit, he's my friend too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How'd I get this tattoo? I know. <laughs> <laughs> he's friends with Tom from MySpace. Uh, everybody's friend <laughs> and that's how tom created myspace he oh. was he was tom from myspace's first friend uh. um, somebody had to be there Yay. um so ron already was a writer and paul asked him if there was anything new in the works um one of these projects that he had kind of built up and he was working on for a while was going to be a picture book specifically where famous miracles had happened the other a biography of a pow and specifically his path to recovery after being tortured wow yeah pretty heavy you know um well the conversation continued diving into questions about how ron would do his research for the pow story An old roommate from college, he said. He's a psychologist who specializes in intense cases of trauma. He's the director of the National Trauma Center in Washington, D.C. I think at this point, we all know where the story's about to go. Yep. (laughs) Well, after a lot of hesitation and after carefully asking questions and thinking about Ron's answers 
Paul floated the idea to him that there may be a slight chance he could connect him to a couple who had an intense experience involving UFOs and aliens. But the catch would be he would have to connect that couple to a psychologist friend and his friend would have to agree to help them with their trauma. Mm, my Aww. God. Double down on Paul. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Paul, Paul, In the Paul, process. Paul. And, and, and further, further, this dude's fucking <clears throat> solid. Further, in the process, if the couple agrees, Ron could write a book about their whole experience. He kept... Tom and Elisa's interests first. He saw an opportunity for an inn. He saw an opportunity to help a friend and his friend's wife who literally saw no hope in sight. He believed them and he wanted to fucking help and he did break their trust. Right? But he did his goddamn best to keep their best interests in mind. He saw an out for them and he wanted to help. And so the conversation went on and Paul got details about what the whole process would look like if all of these ifs came true well three days later Paul calls Tom he tells Tom or he tells Tom everything <laughs> and as anybody would expect Tom is absolutely pissed <laughs> right um, how could you break my trust how could you do that da, 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 this and that and the other and they argue about it and Paul the whole time is trying to be respectful trying to be like hey there's a greater picture here hey I can see you literally telling me you want a way out I'm looking from the other side at a way out just, just trust me my friend like I'm trying to help you here and it, it, it's kind of a, a harsh moment mm. well three days after that Tom calls Paul and says that they're down for it. Yay. Over the next month, Paul had set up multiple phone calls for Ron, Tom, and Elise to talk and get to know each other. Everything went off without a hitch. They got along great, and more importantly, Tom and Elise felt comfortable talking to Ron. By mid-December... They met up in person at the hotel Ron was staying at nearby. They spent the day being interviewed by Ron, every minute being recorded. When it was all done, Ron sent the tapes off to his friend, Bernie Batone, the director of the National Trauma Center in Washington, D.C. In March... After having time to have carefully listened through all of the tapes multiple times, Bernie agreed to clear out his personal schedule for the entire day at the National Trauma Center for Tom and Elise to come in. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Yeah, so to, Friends so to really places. put this... <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but, but also, like in a sense, like it may have got to his ear, but it also earned that position. Like... This person is running the number one trauma center in the entire country. That is his job. He is the goddamn director of this. Like, definitely one of the top centers in the world for trauma. They specifically deal with, like, horrible, horrible cases of, of rape, way beyond just the term rape. They deal with cases of people being POWs for 15, 20, 30, 40 years in countries they deal with insane torture case. they deal with the worst of the worst traumas on the planet this guy is the director of the entire building in the capital of the country he cleared his entire schedule after listening to their testimonies for hours wow and was like i'm gonna give them an entire day send them my way like that's one major step in <laughs> legitimacy in my mind because <laughs> like at a certain point in that level of trauma you gotta start to sound like you've just gone off the rails and he heard them and he's like mm, no I need, I need to bring them in I can't tell like what they're saying totally outside the realm of whoa, acceptable and science and expectations but how they're saying it what they're saying it when they're saying da 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 
I need a closer analysis. Like that was the kind of decision he had to make as somebody who made it that far in his career. It's, I don't know. To me, that's like pretty significant. Yeah, no, right? definitely. He's going to get looked at by the rest of the board, by the rest of the institution about like, how come you just completely dropped all your obligations for the day to bring in these random people from nowhere that weren't even on the schedule? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, that's a... Yeah, so it's a big deal to me. Well, once the date came, Bernie treated Tom and Elise the same as he would any other patient there who was trying to overcome intense trauma. He had them go over and over and over independently their full story repeatedly just asking them questions 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, 40 minutes later. What color was this? What color was that? Da -da 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 -da. Then did you say this? And trying to mislead them, trying to da -da -da -da. like when, when somebody experiences that level of trauma, the memory can get completely fuzzed. I mean, like our memories get fuzzed up on a normal day. Imagine something like this. So he was trying to, to outline the boundaries of the perception of these moments right he repeatedly went through everything etc cetera, etc cetera, for hours on end this took an entire goddamn day way into the evening his final conclusion they didn't have any psychotic hallucinations they aren't crazy they aren't suffering from mental illness it wasn't drug induced and it couldn't have been a military experiment there was no way they could have both misidentified so many different things in such a perfect way. Again, they were both agreeing on thousands of different points of memory. It's not an act of misidentification, and it mm -hmm. certainly is not an act of hallucination. When they asked him if they think that it really happened... What, what he actually thought about it. He responded honestly and professionally. He didn't know what to tell them that happened. But he had the number for a colleague that might be able to help them explore the incident further. Oh my god, so many friends. <laughs> he reached into his desk, pulled out his personal phone-like pad, and jotted down the phone number of a hypnotherapist he knew located in Asheville, North Carolina. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> An old colleague of his that he trusted. Once they finally arrive in Asheville, even more layers, more disturbing details surface. Now, I know I'm going to get some hate mail for this, <laughs> but if you've made it this far, then just please, please, please trust me that you will find it worth it to go out and just read this goddamn book. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil what comes out during hypnotherapy, and I've intentionally... No. Please, please hear me. I've intentionally <laughs> left parts out of this story since the start to make it so anyone that does listen to this would still enjoy reading the book as much as I have. There are there are so many underlying narratives that take place here. Yeah. I can't say enough about this. Also, I really want to point out, it's literally only 200 pages. I know a lot of us aren't used to actually reading physical books anymore, <laughs> but I'm just going to say you probably read 60 pages a day just scrolling through Instagram. Yeah. Like, it, it literally takes no time to read this and digest it. And I also want to point something else out. To further sweeten the deal, I've added a link in the show notes that will help you get and borrow a copy of the book from your own local public library. <laughs> literally. You ain't got to pay for shit. Also, we should support our goddamn libraries. They're actually kind of sweet. And if you don't have patience for that, Papa Bezos got you. There'll also be a link in the show notes so you can buy yourself a copy. <laughs> we love you all. Happy New Year's. Libraries you guys are the have best. DVDs. Don't tell them that. They'll rent the shit I want. <laughs> She's dancing. All right. We love you all. Happy New Year. Um, and y'all are the best. We'll be back next week with another 
I don't know, random fucking story. Take Happy care. Happy New Year. <laughs>